This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And Heidi, there's quite a lot to be pouring cold water on Asian equities in the session today, especially when you take a look at some of the hawkish Fed speak that's been coming through. Yep, uh, and of course, uh, a, a mixed picture when it comes to earnings. Mixed even when the numbers are strong, the likes of Netflix, right? You see just how high investor expectations are. It'll be interesting to see how that plays through to uh, some of the entertainment-related stocks, but also watching those chip stocks uh, in the open as well with the, uh, sort of muted commentary, the pullback from TSMC. We're likely to see a bit of a reaction from the likes of Hynix uh, in this part of the world. Yeah, that's right. TSMC and ASML as well earlier this week. Not great outlooks there. But Japan, South Korea, Australia just coming online here at the start of the day. And what we're tracking is the Japanese yen very closely, continuing, of course, uh, to, to, to watch any levels or, or signals of intervention that we get from Japanese government officials, many of those in Washington this week for the IMF spring meetings. But the headlines that have really been crossing from that is that they are concerned, but also uh, what are the areas or parameters that they have to act in uh, inflation to note as well because we just had some numbers coming out in the last half hour. It did show a general trend of cooling, a little bit weaker than what economists had been predicting ahead of the BOJ meeting. Uh, but still, Tokyo inflation, another one to watch, and that's coming up in a week's time, so we'll track that. Uh, but equities, the picture today, we are under pressure so far. The Nikkei 225 down 1% at this point in time. As you said, really a lot for investors to be tracking today, uh, given, as we said, that hawkish Fed speak, that stronger U.S. eco data earnings as well to note. Let's take a look at Korea coming online here to start the day. Uh, again, it is that picture of weakness that we see. The cost be down 1.2%. You mentioned Netflix. You can see that there in after hours dropping 5%. It's that concern around that weaker forecast for the current quarter. Also, they're going to be stopping to report subscription figures. That is spooking investors somewhat. Korean won there. You are seeing some weakness against the, the greenback. Again, we know Korean currency officials have been in Washington and they are seeking stable FX at this point in time. Take a look at uh, how we're setting up at this Friday session here in Sydney, Bell. And uh, in the first sort of minute or so of that staggered open, we're seeing a little bit of weakness there uh, across uh, trading for the ASX 200. We're seeing in particular this kind of drag that uh, has played out when it comes to Australian mining stocks, despite the rally that we've seen across the commodities more broadly and even some resilience returning to iron ore. We have really seen the Aussie miners uh, underperforming their global peers by the most in almost a year. The likes of Rio Tinto, BHP have been falling in tandem with iron ore prices that continue to come uh, really under under pressure despite the rallies that we've seen gold and copper that hasn't really had too much of an impact there. Watching Australian bonds as well, we saw Treasuries really gaining ahead of the Fed speak uh, and Aussie bonds in that reaction to the unexpected fall in employment numbers as well. We also had uh, some commentary from our conversation with the Australian Treasurer saying that the economy, uh, the Treasury is on track for a second surplus despite these uh, elevated concerns over Chinese growth and how it affects Australian demand. And finally, look at crude oil. We are seeing Brent uh, a little bit softer there, set for that weekly drop, that week of tone offsetting the continued risk uh, that we see across the Middle East. And, of course, they continue to really simmer. But take a look at uh, what we're watching when it comes to US Treasury stumbling on really... Uh, just more Fed speak, really. The mention of a Fed rate hike from the New York Fed president did its work across uh, pricing across the Treasuries. Take a listen. It's not my baseline. My expectation right now is that you know, interest rates are in a good place and eventually at some point would want to lower interest rates as the economy really gets to the 2% inflation that we're headed towards. If the data are telling us that we would need higher interest rates to achieve our goals, uh, then we would, we would obviously want to do that. So it's not my base case. All right, let's bring in our next guest, Harold Vanderlyn. He's head of Asia Equity Strategy at HSBC. And uh, Harold, I'm interested. Let's start with what we just heard there from Williams. Yep. Not saying that a rate hike is the base case, but still it is a, a chance or there, there's a risk of it happening. Is that something that you're also looking at as a scenario that's very much in play? 
No, we, uh, we, we, we're not looking for rate hikes this, uh, this year, still rate cuts. But clearly the risk is shifting, right? And this, mm. this is the story. Uh, the, the risk is shifting that the inflation numbers, they've ticked up a little bit over the last, uh, last reading. Um, maybe something happens with oil has so far stayed okay. But net net, it's, uh, the, there's more inflation risk than we uh, initially anticipated. So that story that we had, what was it, the beginning of the year? Five mm. rate cuts and these sort of seven. things? Seven. Seven was at the wrong point. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so from seven, we've now gone to maybe it's... Uh, uh, it's going to be a rate hike, and I've, I've heard somebody saying that some banks have gone out already, said uh, there will be a rate hike this, this year, right? Mm. So, um, very big shift, and you see that the bond market is pricing that in. So, higher bond yields coming through. The 10-year uh, is now trading at about 46 and that's, that's a dramatic increase, right? And for equities, think about equities. That means that your discount rate for us as analysts, but mm. um, that's a very important number. Um, that, that, that takes, that shaves off quite some, some, uh, yeah, some, some, some valuation. So 10 year is up, equities down, currencies weaker, uh, US dollar stronger. Um, it's all being priced in. That might continue a bit. And I'm curious, because I know your equities, but just if you can re react to this in, in the question of the day, because we're taking a look at when will Treasuries hit that 5% year, five mark, the 10-year, that is. Yeah. Is that something as well that you're seeing? And what would be the flow-on effects from that, do you yeah. think? No, I don't know if we're really going to get there. It's difficult to say, right? Because it's sometimes the market's on a, on a kind of an, on a train. We were on the train of seven rate cuts, as you said, mm. uh, in the early part of the year. Now we're moving in a completely different direction. So sometimes it's got its own momentum, right? Um, I don't look at the treasuries as much, so I don't really think we're going to get that much. But if I look at equities, for example, we're now getting to uh, your 100-day moving averages. You, you're starting to, to get to important levels because if that happens, we're breaking through, then you're going to see another maybe step down or so. Um, uh, so, so if we go to five, then yeah, the equities will have another good step uh, lower uh, across the world. What do you make then of what we're seeing in earnings so far? Is that yeah. going to be something that, that, that is another catalyst to drive markets higher, even against that backdrop of, of high yields at firmer commodity prices? Yeah. Now, th this is interesting because we're talking about the global macro, and that's just not helping Asian equities at the moment. So be it. But actually, the earnings numbers that have come through out of the region it's not so bad. So Chinese earnings, we've gone through reporting season, we've all tallied them up. Uh, looked like last year, uh, so we're still uh, rear view mirror here, last year most people thought there was no growth at all. But if you take the property sector out, it was about, say, close to 15% earnings growth. Not too bad, actually, across the region. Mm. Now, China, this year the expectations are for a slight acceleration. That's probably, that needs to come down. There's some technicalities involved. But we're going to have decent growth across the region, particularly in North Asia. Um, so the that in itself is not enough to support Asian markets, mm. but it provides us with a bit of grounding that if these bond yields go to 5%, yeah, we'll step down. But at some point in time, we say, listen, this, is, this doesn't make sense for the equities to sell off because there is some good growth. Mm. And then you see money starting to come back, but we're not there yet. Uh, how is the currency picture and the volatility that we continue to see playing out when it comes to equity valuations and interest, right, particularly for the likes of Japan? Yeah. No, I mean, at the beginning of the year, we were thinking, hey, the yen could weaken. Uh, oh, sorry, it could strengthen from here. The dollar strength is over. And that will lead to all sorts of interesting changes in, in flow dynamics across the region because money would come out of Japan and then go somewhere else. Now, that story clearly has been moved uh, backwards or further into the future by at least a couple of months or so. So the yen has weakened. Uh, that typically supports uh, the Japanese market, but now we're seeing a sell-off in global equities, so that's why uh, Japanese equities are uh, coming, uh, coming off as well. Uh, but that kind of flow that we were initially anticipating from Japan into the rest of the region, yeah, that, that is not going to happen uh, any, anytime soon. So that also means, by uh, the way, and of course some of the other... If, 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 you go first. No, 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 continue. What are the global implications? No, it means that we thought there would be money going from Japan into the rest of the region, but uh, now it's really global money that needs to come in. Well, at the moment, global money goes back into money market instruments because the rates are moving high. That looks a little bit more interesting. So if we see a, a sort of peak in, in the 10-year bond yield, um, uh, maybe it's close to the 5% that, uh, that we were talking about earlier on, but if we see a peak somewhere there, then maybe that money starts to come back into the region. So it needs to be um, kind of global money that comes uh, back in the region because it's not that Japanese money that's going to drive the uh, markets such as China or India or elsewhere across Asia. 
Harold, you've switched preference from Taiwan to Korea, which I find really quite compelling. Is that because with the Value Up program, the government's efforts, do you expect Korea to get to where Japan has finally gotten to? Because that, most people are saying that's a pretty sort of long-term view. Yeah, no, I think that's a long-term view. Actually, the, there are two reasons why we switched uh, um, our preference for Korea and, uh, and, uh, and Taiwan. First of all, we liked Taiwan because there was good growth in some of the leading companies there, some of the foundry, for example. Now, that is materializing, and those stocks are up, well, they were up 35% at one point in time. So uh, we thought that story has been priced in, while on the margin you have that newer story emerging over the last couple of months in Korea on value up that they want to do, uh, similar to what the Japanese have done, make changes to corporate governance. Now, that is, that, that is a... Uh, hopefully interesting sort of story unfolding in, in Korea, but it's, we're really early days. The Japanese have been on this for almost a decade now. So uh, they've uh, introduced a new index, the Nikkei 400, uh, the so-called shame index. Uh, all kinds of changes were made almost a decade now. So they, they've been working on this for quite some time and figured out what works best for them. The Koreans have just started, and of course, we don't have to wait 10 years because they say, hey, this works in other places. We can implement that as well. You see exactly that's what they do. But it will probably take uh, quite some time for these things to slowly change. But we, we see a bit better dividend payments coming through. Um, here and there, some share buybacks in, uh, in Korea. So um, it, it starts moving in the right direction, but slowly. Harold, always great to have you with us. Harold van der Linde, the head of Asia Equity Strategy at HSBC. Uh, take a look at some of the movers that we're seeing just about 10 minutes or so into the start of trading across Japan, Korea and here in Australia as well. As I mentioned, shipmakers in focus after the muted commentary from uh, TSMC. Also, some of the other companies that are reported across that space are not super positive either. So we are seeing uh, quite a bit of downside. The likes of SK Hynix down by over 3%. Advantest as well. Tokyo Electron, probably the worst performer out of the lot. TSMC scaling back its outlook for a chip market expansion. Really the caution when it comes to smartphone and PC markets remaining pretty weak despite posting its first profit increase in a year and actually beating its estimates. And second quarter sales guidance also beating expectations but uh, that semi-market growth expectation being cut there. Uh, taking a look at some of the streaming names of course on the back of Netflix as we saw really some very robust numbers and in fact you know 9.33 million customers uh, best start to the year since 20 2020 for Netflix, but also saying that gains will slow. We saw shares dropping in late trade and some of these streaming uh, and uh, entertainment related names in Asia also following suit. Bell. Yeah, certainly a lot of weakness across the screen so far in the early part of trade. But still to come, we will talk about the world's biggest exercise in democracy getting underway. That's, of course, the Indian election. It's the first of nearly one billion Indian voters heading to the polls. We'll have a live report from the city of Chennai later this hour. But first, the IMF managing director adds to voices urging China to address overcapacity issues. We hear from Kristalina Georgieva next. This is Bloomberg. The International Monetary Fund says China should get serious about economic reforms and addressing issues of overcapacity. Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva spoke with us as the fund hosts its annual spring meetings in Washington. China needs to continue to seriously address the uh, problems of the property sector that have been uh, handled somewhat but not resolved. They need it for domestic consumer confidence, because many Chinese people think of their apartment as their saving for old age. They also need it because uh, a sector of that significance cannot be put on hold. The second thing I told him is that we are now starting our Article 4 consultation. This is our annual taking the pulse of each economy with China. And that it may be very useful for China if we do more analysis on 
how they can boost domestic demand, how they can exercise their own decision for a dual circulation uh, economy. Yep. And I was, uh, I was delighted that uh, he sees value from the fund uh, to uh, get deeper in these issues and provide China with uh, appropriate advice. They're coming under pressure, you know, they are politically, not just from this administration, Secretary Yellen, but potentially another Trump administration as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have any concerns that they'll lean towards the FX market and just seek out a weaker currency? Well, I, I, that we, I, we haven't seen signs of, uh, of that. But what I do believe is that, uh, yes, if China builds overcapacity and pushes export that create reciprocity of action, and then we are in a world of more fragmentation, not less, that ultimately is not good for China. China wants an integrated uh, global economy. Therefore, what I want to see China doing is to get serious about reforms, get serious about demand and domestic consumption. That was the IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, in Washington with Bloomberg's Jonathan Farrow. Uh, let's get the latest in geopolitics now because the US Congress looks set to approve some $95 billion in long-stalled aid to Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. House Democrats have lined up to back Speaker Mike Johnson's proposal and overcome a planned blockade attempt by Republican conservatives. The House is expected to vote on Saturday, with the Senate taking it up as soon as next week. The plan largely mirrors a package that already passed the upper house in February. The U.S. has imposed fresh sanctions on Iran over this month's strike on Israel, targeting 16 people and entities. That includes a company that helped make engines for the type of drones used in the barrage. President Biden said in a statement that the U.S. is committed to Israel's security. At the same time, allied nations have been imploring Israel not to retaliate against Iran, fearing a wider regional war. And the U.S. has vetoed a bid to make Palestine a full-fledged member of the United Nations. Twelve of 15 Security Council members voted in favour, while the U.K. and Switzerland abstained. Although the Palestinian Authority received enough support to have its bid referred to the General Assembly, the negative vote from the U.S., which wields veto power, was enough to block it. We'll have more ahead on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at how Sony is trading so far in the early part of the session, about 20 minutes into the start of trading. We are seeing downside of about seven tenths of one percent in contrast to the gains of almost 11 percent that we saw for Paramount. Sony and Apollo Global Management considering teaming up in a bid for the film and TV giant. That's according to Bloomberg reporting, speaking to a person familiar with the matter. So Bloomberg Intelligence believes that a joint bid could assuage financing concerns that Paramount may have had with Apollo. Senior media analyst Gita Ranganathan joins us now for more. So uh, give us your analysis in terms of the, the, the benefits of this potential tie-up. Yes, I think it's really good news for uh, for Paramount. So Paramount right now uh, is in exclusive negotiations with uh, Skydance Media. So they're in a due diligence process for, uh, for about a 30-day period. Uh, but there was a lot of investor concern there because uh, there was concern that the non-voting shareholders would actually be diluted uh, and, and somehow the controlling shareholder, which is the Redstone family, would, would kind of uh, benefit uh, at the expense of the non-voting shareholders. So I think this, is a, this, is, this will be a much cleaner deal and one that would be cheered uh, by all the investors. And the fact that Sony is kind of coming in with Apollo, I think definitely uh, – puts to ease any concerns that both the management team at Paramount or any other investor might have had, uh, you know, in terms of financing concerns with, with Apollo, just kind of given uh, Son uh, Sony's deep pockets. Yeah, and Gita, another stock we're tracking in after hours is Netflix, of course, following its earnings. And so many positives to take away from this report, but investors really do seem to be focusing on the negatives. 
Yeah, it was absolutely a blockbuster uh, report card, Annabelle. I mean, you had a subscriber blowout. Uh, they came in, you know, the revenue numbers were really good. Uh, operating margin, they upped their guidance. So everything that, you know, we were looking for, they, they delivered. Of course, uh, one could one could argue that, you know, the, the revenue guidance for the second quarter, uh, as well as for the full year, maybe came in uh, in line to slightly below consensus estimates, which is kind of what is spooking investors right now. I think also embedded in that guidance was the fact that maybe subscriber growth through the rest of the year, especially in the second half, is going to face some very tough comparisons and is going to be a little bit more muted versus the first half. But I think what kind of really rankled investors is the fact that Netflix is going to stop disclosing any subscriber metrics starting uh, the first quarter of 2025. And that really kind of makes it very hard to map out uh, the growth story for Netflix going forward. That was at Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Media Analyst Gita Ranganathan there. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, taking a look now at what's happening with Asian chip makers. We're just under 25 minutes into the session and the sell-off that we're seeing for tech stocks today is accelerating. This is the biggest laggard so far for Asia trading. We had TSMC, of course, uh, uh, scaling back its outlook for a chip market expansion. It's also cautioning that the smartphone PC sectors, those remain weak as well. So let's get more on this now and bring in our Managing Editor for Asia Technology, Edwin Shannon. Edwin, you stack up TSMC. You put that against ASML earlier this week. It doesn't look too great right now. I think the picture is uh, looking a little murky, yes. Um, so T TSMC on the surface uh, produced a, a really solid set of numbers. But I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think the market is zeroing in on commentary uh, during the earnings call. I I think uh, they're looking at uh, especially TSMC scaling back its expectations for market growth. And what we're seeing is a bit of a dichotomy right now between uh, AI demand growth, which uh, will underpin longer term uh, business for TSMC and in the short term, a smartphone and PC market weakness. Edwin, take a moment to clear your throat there because we can take a look at how those stocks are faring again. As we said, really big losses building in so far for, for some of the Asian chip makers. Uh, a lot of weakness coming through uh, if, given what you said around TSMC and, and perhaps some concerns around the outlook, even though the number's looking a little bit better. But what's the read through on this for, for, for other big tech names like Apple, NVIDIA, for instance? So in terms of the warning on smartphones, I think the news does not look that good for Apple. Um, still by far, I think, its biggest customer, uh, previously about a quarter of revenue. I think uh, the smartphone market remains depressed. But with NVIDIA, you know, there's two things at work here. Yes, uh, TSMC was very upbeat about AI demand going forward. But at the same time, there is a debate going on in the market, as you know, about whether chip shares, AI chip shares, have run ahead of themselves. And I think some of that is also playing into the sell-off we're seeing. Edwin, when you take a look at, I guess, a longer, a t longer term demand dynamics, is generative AI and the demand that we continue to see from that, uh, even as we see that kind of downside reaction across markets today, is that still ultimately the bigger tailwind? I think so. I mean, there's a general consensus that this is a once in a generation kind of technology that is going to revolutionize uh, the way we essentially interact with technology and the way we live. Um, the question is, is the current training boom, the current development boom, the current creation boom, uh, ru again, running ahead of itself? And how many of these large language models we're seeing built with these expensive NVIDIA chips are going to be viable and or uh, extensive platforms in the longer term. Um, but I think there's no question that when you talk about generative AI, uh, you know, about a, a year or two ago, it took a lot of us by surprise, you know, its capabilities and a potential, and it continues to surprise. And I believe over the long term, companies like TSMC and NVIDIA will benefit. Managing Editor for Asia Technology, Edwin Chan there in Hong Kong. More to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg.
inflation is high, it's too high, and we need to get it to our 2% target. The pathway to 2% is going to be slower than people expect, uh, and it'll be bumpy. I'm of the view that things are going to be slow enough this year that we won't be in a position uh, to reduce our rates uh, toward, until toward the end of the year. I think the Fed will get some data that's positive, give them some room, but I do think they'll be patient and deliberate. So an expectation of fewer cuts, a little more delayed makes sense. But ultimately, I think for investors, what matters is rates will at some point be coming down, and that's a positive. That was the Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic and Blackstone President and CEO Jonathan Gray on the Fed's rate policy. And that is certainly one of the key drivers of the market direction so far this morning. Just this general continued chorus, hawkish Fed speak coming through and telling us the Fed is not likely to cut rates anytime soon. There's always that chance outside, of course, but chance that we do see a hike as well if inflationary continues to be present, those price pressures, that bit of resurgence that we're seeing as well. Uh, how that's playing out it impacts growth stocks in particular. We've seen tech under pressure also after some weaker earnings or, or actually some more solid earnings, but investors looking at more of the weaker aspects. And you're seeing tech there really leading the drop so far for equities. But Japan feeling the brunt of that, the Nikkei 225 down 2% at this point. What else we're tracking, of course, is, is the currency reaction to what's been very much a strong dollar dynamic. And that's really playing out in what we see for the yen here. Uh, Japanese yen versus the greenback. You're still overboard at these levels on a 14-day uh, RSI basis, but trading above 75. That is the longest level of overbought territory we've seen since July last year and uh, really plays into to the story of yield divergence that you see be, be, between the Fed and the BOJ. And the question, of course, is, is what is the path ahead for the, for the Bank of Japan? Are we looking for any sort of normalisation? But inflation figures play into that and we actually had CPI in Japan easing more than expected in March, but it's still set above the central bank's inflation target. That comes ahead of the BOJ meeting, of course, those numbers next week. And let's get more with our Asia Economy and Government Senior Editor, Brian Fowler in Tokyo. And uh, Brian, what's, what's your takeaway from the numbers that came out earlier? Yeah, well, uh, I think the key word, as you said, is divergence. So in Japan, We've actually had inflation come in a little bit slower than expected, and yet we don't think it's going to derail the BOJ from hiking rates later this year. Next week, the BOJ meets, and economists widely expect policymakers to stand pat. At the same time, they're going to revise their forecast for CPI for this year, next year, and introduce new forecasts for the year from 2026. And everyone expects, most, most expect CPI to be revised higher to 2.6% for this year. That reflects uh, optimism about wages, uh, which came in, as you know, much higher than expected. The wage hikes for this year were much higher than expected. There's some sense that that will probably encourage workers to spend more money as real incomes rise for the first time in a long time. That could spur demand-led inflation and keep in price growth at a pretty steady pace, again, well above the BOJ's 2% target. Brian, you, you talk about standing pat in the next meeting. Uh, October is market consensus. July is being flagged as a risk. Is an earlier move from the BOJ a possibility if they're really concerned about the levels of the yen? We did hear from Finance Minister Suzuki talking in uh, Washington saying that, look, yes, it is the rate divergence, but that's just one of the factors driving the moves in the currency. Yeah, it's absolutely a big risk. The weak yen, of course, the yen's at, at a 34-year low against the dollar, and that's putting a lot of upward pressure on imports. And there are other risk factors. Let, let's talk about food. So in the latest month, uh, processed food price growth actually slowed a little bit, and that pulled the, the overall index down. We know from Takeoka Data Bank that the number of companies announcing way, uh, price hikes for food was quite relatively low for March. That number is going to shoot up in April. We already know it's going to be about three times the number of, uh, of price increases that we saw in the previous month. So food will probably pick up. It's also uh, wide, you know, commodity prices are shooting up around the world. Look at cocoa. 
at a record high. Japan's a big market for chocolate. So we're going to see a lot of risk factors, factors pushing up inflation, and that could prompt the BOJ to move a little bit faster than the market consensus says. Our Asia government and uh, economy and government senior editor, I should say, Brian Fowler there in Tokyo. Well, China's Ministry of Commerce has slammed a U.S. threat to impose new restrictions on its steel and aluminium products. It says Washington is politicizing economic issues and undermining the security of the global supply chain. President Biden is proposing 25 percent levies on some of the products as part of an ongoing review. Analysts say the steps would have minimal economic impact. Well, intellectual property protection is also a key focus for American and Chinese officials amid trade and tech tensions. The U.S. Undersecretary for Intellectual Property, Kathy Vidal, met this week with a top Chinese official. We asked her what message she delivered. So the message was that we need strong intellectual property protection here in China. Uh, we spoke a lot about innovation. Uh, he communicated the importance of innovation to China. And I spoke about U.S. companies' interests in being here in China, but being successful. And they really need a strong IP ecosystem in order to be successful. Now, I've been covering China for more than 30 years. And every year, IP threat and the threat of IP theft has always been a big issue. It seems to be uh, you know, not at the fore right now in U.S.-China relations. But I'm guessing from your remit uh, as, uh, you know, in the Commerce Department as head of IP protection that it is front and center of your attention. Where are the biggest sticking points right now? So one of the big issues that we're seeing right now is transparency. Uh, so as you mentioned, it's always been somewhat at the fore in terms of interest of U.S. companies. Uh, right now, there have been some improvements made in China when it comes to legislation, when it comes to some of the counterfeiting issues. Uh, but we're still seeing major issues with regard to transparency. Uh, we're also seeing new issues emerging when it comes to counterfeit products uh, and then some trade uh, secret and trademark issues as well. Now, this was at the forefront of the phase one trade deal under the previous administration, the Trump administration. It was also addressed by Xi and Biden in November on the sidelines of APEC in San Francisco. Uh, but again, the problem always seems to be is enforcement on the Chinese side. Is that what you're seeing? It's not getting from discussion to real practices in China. Uh, that's correct. There have been a lot of legislative moves within China. I know that since 2020, we have actually commented on over 45 measures in China. So we're starting to see some positive progress, uh, but it really comes down to the implementation. And as you mentioned, enforcement is always an issue. We are seeing some improvements in enforcement when it comes to counterfeit products, but we have a lot of issues still with U.S. company when it comes to online sales and also some protectionism that we're seeing in local communities. Communities. Where are we seeing the biggest infringements that you can see? Obviously, it's much more sophisticated now than it was 20 years ago when DVDs were being pirated and sold on the street corners of Beijing. It's much more sophisticated and probably higher value items now. Uh, it, it is. And I will say one of the places we're seeing a lot of infringements is through live streaming. So for e-commerce, some of the issues before were more platform related. Uh, we still have those issues here in China, uh, but we're seeing new modalities coming out, including live, live streaming, where a product will be offered for sale and then it'll disappear. So it's really hard to find out who the actual infringer is. Have you moved the needle? It's going to be a process, as you mentioned, and I think it's just continued dialogue and making sure that we're heard on the key issues and that our counterparts and government uh, officials understand the impact of some of what's happening in China. Uh, I believe they do. Uh, it's just a matter of continuing to work forward uh, and push for progress, which we're going to continue to do. That was the U.S. Undersecretary for Intellectual Property, Kathy Vidal, speaking with our colleague Stephen Engel. And coming up, the first of India's almost one billion voters start heading to the polls today, beginning a six-week election process. We're live to the city of Chennai next. This is Bloomberg.
Well, India's six-week national elections begin on Friday, with the first of nearly one billion eligible voters to begin casting their votes. Bloomberg's has Linda Armin breaks down those numbers. It's the largest electoral exercise in the world. 968 million adult Indians are eligible to cast a vote on five and a half million voting machines. 18 million of those would be first-time voters in their teens, with a further 197 million in their 20s. 15 million polling agents will be deployed across a million polling stations in 543 constituencies. Some of these constituencies hold as many as 3 million voters. That's equivalent to the population of Jamaica. To keep the process safe, 2 million security personnel were deployed in the 2019 polls. That was also the world's most expensive election. India, With $8.7 billion spent by candidates and political parties in India. 2024's seven-phase, six-week election runs from April 19th to June 1st, with the outcome known on June 4th. Hasan the Amin, Bloomberg News. Let's get more on India's elections and bring in Bloomberg News editor Manika Doshi, who's outside a polling station in the southern city of Chennai, the capital of Tamil Nadu state. Uh, Manika, great to have you with us. And of course, this is just the beginning of a marathon process in terms of this uh, demonstration of democracy in India. What are we expecting? Uh, what's at stake here? And, and I guess what's the sort of atmosphere that you're hearing, you're, you're, you're feeling there? Well, good morning, Heidi. The atmosphere right now is quiet, but in a few minutes from now, or maybe uh, 30 or 40 minutes from now, you will see activity pick up at this polling booth. Now, as that video showed, this is not just the world's uh, largest, uh, you know, democratic electoral exercise, but it's also taking place in the world's fifth largest and fastest growing economy. And that gives it both domestic and international implications. Now, this in Chennai is what I could co also call iPhone land. Uh, many of Apple's vendors have facilities or are likely to build facilities in this state of Tamil Nadu. But this is also the state that will host one of the fiercest battles this election, as incumbent Prime Minister Modi seeks to make inroads into southern India, a region that has so far resisted his charm. He is hoping that seats in this part of India will help him go into the history books with a third term and more than 400 of 543 seats at stake. And Menika, the significance of, of India's election clearly has gl major global implications as well. I mean, you've got more than 50 countries around the world that are voting this year, but India's outcome is going to be one of the most closely watched, perhaps. Yes, it is. And uh, let, let, me, let me tell you why. Uh, in a few days from now, we're going to have Elon Musk in the country. India has been quoting Musk for investment. And some of that investment might, in fact, even come to Tamil Nadu. Now, he, many stories are at play in this election. There is the national story of India seeking its rightful place in the international world order. And by rightful, I mean, uh, you know, proportionate to the size of its economy and its population. India also seeking to grab some share that's moving away from China, a very, very competitive space at this point in time. So there are many economic considerations at stake internationally. And of course, domestically, whoever comes to power next will determine the policies that will shape how competitive India is to take advantage of all those opportunities. That was Bloomberg News editor Manika Doshi there on the ground as India's voting gets underway. But uh, let's shift now to Indonesia because the finance minister says her government is working with the central bank to cushion the country's economy from the impact of a strong US dollar. She spoke exclusively to Bloomberg at the IMF and World Bank meetings in Washington. Certainly the movement of the exchange rate, uh, it will affect uh, many of the Indonesian economy and financial. Uh, on the export side, of course, the revenue is going to be much better uh, because they are going to receive a local currency. 
but we also in this case dependent on some import and that will then translate it into a higher uh, rupiah to the uh, dollar and imported inflation it can uh, also affect uh, the inflation in Indonesia so we have to be very careful at this very moment especially because of the movement coming from the policy uh, coming from the advanced country especially United States then the emerging country have to be very very uh, vigilant with this development but what we've already done since the ASEAN financial crisis global financial crisis a lot of exercise has been done in order to improve the resiliency of the financial sector and the economic in general Indonesia the same thing uh, so on economic point of view we are actually having a very good uh, structure and resilient to that point what else can you do? Because the speed of upside for the dollar, as well as the absolute level, is quite intense. What are some of the tools at your disposal to help the strong dollar, to help the sovereign and fiscal market also? Well, we have to make sure that the macro stability will continue to, uh, to be maintained. And in this case, uh, on the monetary and fiscal side, we work very closely with Governor Perry in order for us to be able to adjust the macro stand in order to adapt with this new level of pressure. In this case, for the central bank, they definitely have their interest rate, policy rate, uh, and uh, uh, in terms of responding to the current situation. For us, in the fiscal side, we have to make sure that the budget can play an effective and credible shock absorber. On the one hand, we have to make sure that the deficit is going to be within or below the 3%. This is what the Indonesia fiscal prudence, which is going to be continued to be implemented. On the other hand, we have to make sure and be more selective in actually expenditure side and making sure that the revenue that will also increase due to this strong dollar, because some of our revenue is actually in a forex denomination, that can also be used in the most optimal way. So a combination of monetary fiscal in order for us to be able to maintain the macro stability and prudence will be very important. On the corporate side, I think they need to be really look at how their exposure to the forex and many of them is already playing or in this case uh, doing the hedging policy at the corporate level. I think Indonesia will be continue resilient uh, in this kind of situation, but yes, need to be very vigilant. It was Indonesian Finance Minister Sri Mulyani and Drawati there speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Alex Steele. You can watch us live and see our past interviews on our interactive TV function. That's at TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions we talk about. Join in on the conversation as well. You can send us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out. It is at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Well, China is seeking to end years of speculator-driven boom and bust trading by pivoting toward value investment. Its latest nine-point guideline includes measures to encourage dividend payments and improve the quality of new stock offerings. For more, let's bring in Asia Stocks reporter John Cheng. And John, just tell us more about this so-called nine-point guideline and, and how is it different as well from the previous rhetoric that we've had? So this is a uh, once in a decade uh, set of guidelines rolled out by Chinese authorities that has been launched twice before in 2014 and 2004. It's a set of sweeping measures including everything from improving the quality of stock listings, high, high, higher threshold for uh, the listing to improving dividends for shareholders, etc. So I think while some of the measures aren't completely new, for example, we had this whole uh, state-owned enterprise reform talks last year and also a uh, higher threshold for stock the listing has been in the works for many many years although there's a lack of actual progress but i think this time there's more enthusiasm in this uh, new 
set of guidelines rolled out by authorities because it comes at a time when the Chinese economy and the Chinese market are facing a lot of challenges, both internally and externally. We have the property crisis. We also have like a higher U.S.-China tensions. But at the same time, we see sentiment in the market slowly improving and the stock market rebounding a little bit. So this is really adding more confidence for people who are betting on a stock rebound in China. And a lot of people are saying this could be a mid to long term catalyst for a sustainable rally in Chinese stocks. There are investors comparing this campaign to what we've seen with Japan, with Korea. Obviously, both of those are longer term uh, campaigns where Japan is kind of just starting to come to fruition. Is this a fair comparison? I would say it's definitely drawing some investor attention. It seems to be a common theme across uh, the free markets, the corporate governance uh, reform theme. Of course, like Japan and Korea have uh, moved faster than China. We have um, the PB uh, campaign in Tokyo launched uh, last year by the Tokyo Stock Exchange and then more recently followed by the value of program in Korea, although that progress is sort of has seen some uncertainty given the recent parliamentary election results. But more recently, China is also following up on that, although it's not solely relying on just improving corporate governance, but also improving the quality of the capital market. So I think there's uh, some similarities, but also some differences. But I think the sense is that uh, there's certainly a lot of room for China to catch up with Japan and Korea on that front uh, in terms of uh, improving shareholder return and also uh, boosting dividend, et cetera. And uh, if it's so, then following the uh, pathways of uh, Japan and Korea, there's certainly more long term upside in the Chinese stock market, as we've seen in the Japan and Korea stock market recently. Oh, Asia stocks reporter John Chang there uh, with a look at these renewed efforts from Chinese policymakers to boost the stock market. Take a look at how futures are shaping up at the moment. Uh, US futures are looking like this. It is a down day really kind of across the board as we see uh, a lot of this Fed speak, the consistently strong eco data in the US starting to really compound sentiment in this market. We're seeing S&P futures still off above four tenths of one percent, uh, looking like we'll see an extension of that sell off that we had overnight. Taiwan futures uh, down pretty steeply, 2.2% lower, expecting a lot of the semiconductor mm. names and potentially even the entertainment names to see some weakness there, Bell. Yeah, that's right. Actually, when you take a look at the IMAP function, I thought think it sort of tells the story of what we can expect to see for the rest of the session. It's that big drop you're seeing for IT coming through so far, uh, off around 1.5% at this point in time. Uh, leading the decline, TSMC, of course, is playing into it. Some positives to draw from the earnings, but investors are looking toward the negatives, and they're doing the exact same thing today with Netflix numbers. Best start to the year since 2020, but still it's that focus on the current quarter guidance and as well that they're removing subscription figures from 2025. Uh, but broadly today, it's a lot of red across the screen. You can see there every single sector in the red. And that also comes down to that hawkish Fed speak that's been coming through and the outside risk, but still a chance that we see a rate hike that was referenced by the Fed's Williams as well. Uh, that's it from Daybreak Asia. Our markets coverage continues as we look ahead to the start of trade in mainland China and Hong Kong.